And so part of what we've been talking about here and alluding to is this natural intelligence. It's kind of the, the elephant in the room. You can call it God, you can call it whatever, but right now there are 50 trillion cells in your body. There's this homeostasis that, that Deepak talks about as well too. And we know if you look at the work of Michael Gazzaniga, who would be great to get here too, is that we know that things happen and then the left side of the brain tries to make sense of what's going on and that creates a narrative feeds our hippocampus and you know, we kind of know. And then if you look at the work of Benjamin Libet, it kind of the body kind of seems to know before the mind. And so there is this kind of intuitive insight from somatic awareness. So the same forces that are creating the new DNAs that are splitting your cells are the same forces that are creating those, moving those, creating those new, co new cosmos. It's the same thing here, right? It's the same forces and it's intelligent. The fact that we're all here, the last ones at this conference, you know, that's significant. And so, you know, Deepak has quoted him a couple times. He's a big fan of, I'm a big fan of his as well too, is intelligence highly awakened is intuition, which is the only true guide in life. And so the question is, can we come from this no mind state and reconnect with our intuition and work from that versus this mentally constructed worldview? Now the current methodology that we have is we're born, we develop instinct, we get conditioned, we develop intellect, and then intellect will only get us so far. And then some of us discover kind of intuition and insight and we're able to work from that. The way I like to say this is we're born with instinct. I might see a girl there, oh, she's really hot. You know, so, oh, go, I gotta procreate, right? That's instinct, but, oh wait, I'm married. <laughs> so instinct and intellect clash, and then intellect generally wins out. But then if you ask yourself, you know, how did you choose your wife? How did you choose your husband? How did you decide to make the big decisions in life? It just, I don't know, it just kind of happened. There was a feeling, you know, call it your gut. Something happened and for some people, you know, the thing that kicks you out of an intellectual, rational point of view is these synchronicities. You know, we just had a breakfast where three people all doing media, trying to do broadcasting, we just all kind of showed up. And so how does all of this happen? I don't know, what are the chances? boggles the mind. And so it's that boggling of the mind that takes people out of the rational perspective and then starts looking at non-causal ways and really looking at how does reality kind of appear. And so that leads to a re relationship with intuition and insight. Initially it's like, you know, well, was that real? But then gradually you're like, oh wait, I can stand there. And then eventually you're like, hey, wow, I can be here or I can be here or I can have one foot in both. Now, the last talk, and the thing that really motivates me to do what I'm doing, is this unspoken co co covenant that we've had between generations. We had this deal that really hasn't been signed or anything between generations. Leave the planet in a better shape than you got it. You know, and right now, up until recently, we're doing pretty good, but then recently, you know, we've heard the doom and gloom stuff. No. You know, and if you look at what's motivating that, what's the underlying current behind that, it's action from thought, fear, need, and desire, right? And so for me, I've been working on video games and internet and how do we facilitate transformation, leverage the internet and then create a virus that facilitates transformation and induces awakening to do collective awakening. And so we've been building that team and that was the mythology we were going on before until two months ago. And the new insight that I had was I trying to figure out how do we wage a war against conflict? How do you fight fighting itself? And then the, thing, the other thing about no mind is it's about being somatically informed. And we're doing our work on video games. I wrote a paper on video games that led to this view and it just dawned on me that kids, I have four, no mind, right? And they have, they're acting directly from soma. You know, if you look at kids, they're just, you know, you've, you know, they're just, right? And so there has, the, they have this. And the other thing that inspired me, because a lot of people ask me about parenting, is the, uh, you know, the, the prophet. You know, he's got this great quote on children. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backwards, nor tarries with yesterday. And what, if you look at what we do in terms of educating our children, we're basically doing this. Right? Right? And our system is backwards. So parents then, you know, these kids are born effectively enlightened, they just can't speak. And what happens is we impose our, and they're, they're physically dependent on us, which is an issue, and there's a big difference between physical and mental, which most people don't get, but if you do get it, it you're enlightened. Um, but so 
So they're physically dependent, and then they start constructing a worldview, and then the parents lay their conditioning on the kids, and then culture lay even more conditioning on them, and they spend the rest of their lives coming to conferences like this and finding their way back. You know, which has made Deepak a very wealthy person, I'm sure. But, but the, the point is, you know, there are a lot of people that are rediscovering what they already had. And so with this insight, I started exploring. And my research methodology is her, Onira. Her name is Dreams. It's the young one. I messed on the first three already, but they're, they're doing OK. But, but the latest one is the one I've been really looking at, and really looking at new approaches to parenting. So from a Vedic perspective, the child has this natural intelligence. So how do we preserve and listen to and engage this natural intelligence? Almost like how do we mine knowledge from this thing that has natural, natural intelligence that can't speak? It's almost like dealing with aliens, right? And so again, with this, they've done studies. Kids at the age of five are like 9% creative. By the time they're 17, they're less. By the time they're parents, they're even less. And so by engaging parents and kids in a meaningful way, they rediscover their wonder and joy of living as well, too. So it's, I think there's a multiplier effect on this. And the strongest, arguably the strongest psychological force is the love between a mother and a child. I know it is for my wife. I tell you, after we had kids, <laughs> what? What are you still doing here? <laughs> right? And so the question is, can your baby be your guru? You know, nonverbal communication, you know. Babies can hold up flowers just as easily, right? And then awareness and a lot of the nonverbal communication. And rather than laying our conditioning, can we engage this in a more meaningful way? And so some of the other approaches, I'm working with Willie Smits on another project. He's in Indonesia. And he's been working with orangutans. And my engagement with a baby is almost identical to his engagement with an orangutan. They're very sensitive. And you just have to come in from the right place. And then you, you mirror and, and you create a new language. I mean, he's told me stories where he's got orangutans that have given him leaves of ants, and he'll just eat it, because that's, that's what you do when an orangutan gives you a leaf with a bunch of ants on it. Mm -hmm.